Good morning, everyone. Good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. I'm so delighted that you're joining us today. Um, I'm Gayatri Gopinath. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality here at NYU. Um, welcome to the panel, Crisis Ordinariness, Lauren Berlant's Cruel Optimism in a Transnational Frame. So this is actually the final panel of the semester um, in an ongoing webinar, webinar series that we at CSGS at NYU um, have been hosting in collaboration with the Center for Studies in Gender and Sexuality at Ashoka University in New Delhi. Um, and that's, that's a center that's directed by Professor Madhavi Menon. So the series entitled Theory and Practice places scholars in the US and South Asia, as well as other global sites in conversation to engage in a truly transnational dialogue in feminist and queer studies. So please do check out our previous webinars um, in the series. They're online at our website at CSGS NYU, as well as CSGS Ashoka. Um, so just to give this panel a little bit of framing, as many of you know, um, this is the 10th anniversary of the publication of Lauren Berlant's groundbreaking monograph, Cruel Optimism. And it's actually just a few months after Berlant's own untimely passing, in the summer of this year. So we mean the panel to be both a celebration and an honoring of Berlant's book, uh, which gives us a thick description of the neoliberal present and its affective modes, anxiety, precarity, insecurity, exhaustion, spacing out. So for Berlant, the so-called good life represents the deadening strictures of normativity that are further and further out of reach and assimilation that is forever over the rainbow, as she puts it. We specifically wanted to stage a conversation between scholars from very different geographic and political vantage points, India, the US-Mexico border, and Hong Kong, in order to reflect on how Berlant's trenchant critique of psychic enactments or attachments in the context of the ordinariness of crisis resonate today both within and beyond the borders of the US. So what happens when we rest Berlant's notions of cruel optimism and the good life and her analysis of the exhaustion of life under late capitalism outside a Euro-American frame? What emerges in these other sites? So I can think of no better scholars to help us think through these questions than the ones we have with us today. So I'm going to very briefly introduce our panelists and you can find their full bios um, on our website, as well as in the chat. So our first speaker is Brinda Bose, who teaches at the Center for English Studies at JNU in New Delhi. Her interests are in gender and sexualities, modernist and avant-garde literatures, and film studies. Her monograph, The Audacity of Pleasure, Sexualities, Literature, and Cinema in India, was published in 2017. And her edited collection, Humanities Provocateur, towards a Towards a Contemporary Political Aesthetics came out in July of this year. She's also the author of um, a chapbook of poems that came out last year entitled Calcutta, Crow, and Other Fragments. Our next speaker is Maria Josefina Saldana Portillo, who is a professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU. She is the author of two prize-winning monographs, most recently Indian Given, Racial Geographies Across Mexico and the United States, published by Duke in 2016, and The Revolutionary Imagination in the Americas and the Age of Development, also from Duke in 2003. She's also the author of over 30 articles on revolution, subaltern politics, indigenous peoples, racial formation, and migration to the US. And finally, we have Alvin King Wong, who is assistant professor in comparative literature at the University of Hong Kong. His research and teaching interests include Hong Kong culture, Chinese cultural studies, Sinophone studies, transnational feminism, and queer theory. Alvin is writing a book entitled Queer Hong Kong as Method, and he has published in numerous journals and edited volumes and co-edited the volume Keywords in Queer Sinophone Studies, which was published by Routledge in 2020. So just to give you a sense of how this event will go, um, it will last one hour, and we'll begin with opening statements from each of the panelists lasting from about eight to 10 minutes. Um, 
I'll then moderate a discussion between our three panelists for the next 15 minutes or so. And the last 15 minutes will be devoted to questions from you, the audience. And so we absolutely want to hear from you. So at any point um, during the panelists talks, please submit your questions in the Q&A function rather than in the chat. So your questions, the audience questions will be fielded by Shriyashi Sharma from CSGS Ashoka University. So thank you so much to Shriyashi for doing that. And I also wanna thank our co-sponsor, the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. So warm welcome to Brinda, Josie and Alvin. And Brinda, we'll begin with you. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Gayatri, and thank you for organizing this panel. It's an honor to be here. Um, it's a morning and a celebration together uh, for Perlan's passing and uh, the 10-year mark for a very, um, a very significant book. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it, it's ironically uh, cruel optimism uh, in, in a way. Uh, for me, cruel optimism has spoken most insistently through Berlant's expositions on the aesthetic and the political. In fact, the aesthetic as political in an enjambment of crisis ordinariness. This enjambment has escalated in India since the 1990s, uh, corresponding with economic liberalization and with extreme ferocity over the past seven years, the right wing government and its stooges in our public institutions tightening the news and the liberal left uh, thrashing around in distress and a nostalgic moral grandstanding of its own. And indeed, uh, the sense of looming terror has been exacerbated in the past two years, of course, over the pandemic. What price fantasies of good life then we might ask, and is there now only phantasmatic loss? And yet, while trauma and affect studies have swept through our universities, I uh, have tended to read cruel optimism against uh, the wave of, of, of trauma and, um, and uh, her uh, sentiments that, that it almost exclusively seems to be um, uh, read because I've always thought that the book is far more uh, complex and, and, uh, than that. Than that. Um, that Berlant was a scholar of, of literature is often almost uh, overlooked in drawing on their work. Um, but nowhere is that deep love and engagement in the aesthetics of words, sounds, and visual texts more clearly evidenced than in this book, um, uh, both richly evocative and sharply political. The work is capacious, of course, and has something for everyone. But it does, does not speak to me as one that valorizes art as, as mourning and memorialization alone. Rather, it fashions aesthetics as a chiseled political intervention that becomes, uh, to use uh, Berlant's terms, glitch and impasse in crises of the ordinary, instead of recording or representing crises in various modes of complaint or sadness uh, or, or, or silence. I will speak from my location in India about how Berlant's querying of that pitch, as I see it, has led me to think about new genres and emergent aesthetics against, again, the two terms that, uh, that uh, they have used um, often in, in the book, um, locally, always becoming rather than being. Um, I'll just have uh, Robert has uh, has offered very kindly to to uh, play my, a few slides uh, that will provide some basic context for the text that I will qu uh, qu quickly walk through. Um, cruel optimism to me is a vast and intricately argued philosophical rumination on political aesthetics, as I said. What I've highlighted here in, in red uh, particularly is uh, Berlant's premise that it is not the trauma caused by crises, but the changes forced by crises um, uh, and, by, and by crisis uh, ordinariness that are to be studied in the forms uh, they take to mediate them. So the gesture is a potential event, but the present is a stretch of time that is resistant, an impasse, experienced in transitions and transactions. And I think those two words are very, very important. Berlant's deep curiosity about how aesthetic forms uh, respond to times of crises suggests to me that it is their way to map complexities of social, political, philosophical, psychological, and cultural negotiations, detouring though uh, very, very definitively through the creative and the imaginative, attracted by transgressions and dissensions. In and of itself, this method of conceptualizing affect through a political and philosophical inquiry 
into the aesthetics of new genres, for me is a difficult queer method of understanding a time and its crises of the ordinary. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, I'll just run through a few um, texts of, of, from various genres that, uh, that have spoken uh, to me through this book. Philip Chitre, bilingual uh, poet and critic in Marathi and English, um, had the pulse of many in post-independence India. In what I see as a Berlantian gesture, he turns uh, in, the, in the lines that I've highlighted toward the solider object of surviving feeling, relying on the image, um, and, and the double crossing metaphor to slay the mood. Feeling is capitalized, personified, and the poet must survive it or it may smother him. Such has been this long dury of reckoning, the poets know the variations of which Berlant writes. People are destroyed in it or discouraged, but maintaining or happily managing things or play playful and enthralled. Uh, this is in uh, Cruel Optimism, page 200. The poem mounts an impasse to wallowing in feeling who may be the enemy. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, Berlant has talked at length of the novel form in literature and its contortions to capture contemporary crises. Arundhati Roy's second novel published in 2017, which I have called elsewhere an anti-novel, deriving from Nikonor uh, Para's idea of anti-poetry, revolted against its lineages of the Indian English novel to tell a shattered story uh, in broken and scattered form. In moving from slowly becoming everybody to slowly becoming everything, Roy draws attention to processes of transformation and mutation, breaking up narratives to mimic uh, shattered lives and artifacts. Roy has talked of her novel as layered, a word that Berlant also uses in the book when talking of Greg Bortowitz's fil uh, film of 2001, Habit, a work that, uh, that Berlant says enables him to understand his own historical present through the protagonist's own senses, through the reported stories of others, through a multitude of sonic layerings. Roy's two protagonists in the ministry, um, the transgender Hijra uh, uh, character Anjum, formerly Aftab, and Tilo, who has eyes like broken glass, offer a multitude of visual layerings of landscape and people in a space where urgencies of livelihood are worked out all over again, to use Berlant's words, without assurances of futurity, but nevertheless proceeding via durable norms of adaptation. And I think this works uh, really well for, uh, for what Troy does uh, with her novel. The next slide, please. Amis Ravening is a 2019 film from the state of Assam in the Northeast of India, a region that is known to enjoy its meats as much as the North of the country generally shuns it. It is a film that moves rapidly from being about a couple's pleasure in meat eating, in food, to being about devouring each other, literally, erotically, transforming what I, I think uh, into what Berland calls a glitch, an interruption in a transition which has an impasse, no longer an aberration and a hold up merely, but a short circuiting of desire in Deleuzean terms. Crisis ordinariness encounters crisis extraordinaire. Here is a brave new and shocking new genre and a film that may well uh, brew an emergent aesthetics, not for its horrors of fresh eat, flesh eating alone, but for the quiet resolute fortitude with which the couple own their dissolute desires and are ready to pay for them with their lives. A cinema of erotic cannibalism becomes the glitch in a long lineage of the cinema of precarity. The next slide, please. Shomna Thor, artist from Bengal who, had, uh, who, who just marked his uh, birth centenary this year, offers an opportunity of seeing the wound as a living wounding symbol of impasse in crisis ordinariness. From the 1970s, Hoare produced a series of paper pulp prints which he gouged out, sometimes staining it with bits of red and, and brown to create visual tactile impressions of woundings that embody a minimalist aesthetics at distinct odds with the victim's large pain, constituting again, I think what Berlant might have called a disturbance in the situation of the present and the adaptations improvised around it. We see how a tactile aesthetics contends with the contingency of bruising, again, a term that, uh, that Berlant uses, 
turning itself into a bruise one can both see and touch. Uh, this, the next slide, please. I will end with Anish Kapoor exhibiting this year at Oxford, his bludgeoning new work constituted of enormous and engulfing wounds, the exposing of human entrails and genitalia, blood soaked, blood coagulated, blood congealed. He stands perhaps at the opposite end of the spectrum from Shomnath Hor's minimalism, yet both sets of art equally are shocking and wrenching. Together then, through more than 50 years, this random selection is a historical and political testament to an aesthetics that can imaginatively transform into an impasse or a glitch for crisis ordinariness that speak to one another and us locally as well as transnationally, that resist all norms and ethics of genteel squeamishness by disturbing and enthralling, that layer it, its texts like a palimpsest of innocence and experience that no longer merely captures the impasse of the transitional moment, but becomes that very impasse. I suggest that in a queer mode of transitioning, the texts metamorphose into the context of their being, caught in their moments of becoming. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brenda. That was so rich. Um, so let's move on to Alvin. Okay. And I will um, try sharing my screen here. Um, It's uh, working for screen. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Gayatri um, for this uh, kind invitation and also uh, for um, NYU and Ashoka universities for um, this um, really important um, event um, that um, also uh, helps me think about um, to reflect on uh, Berlin's uh, really um, important and a few um, changing uh, book, uh, Cruel Optimism, and particularly to think about it um, at this moment in relationship to Hong Kong and uh, queer theory and affects. So um, in, Lauren Ber uh, in Cruel Optimism, uh, Lauren Berlanz offers a transformative analysis of late capitalism, affects, and modes of attachments that resonates with many issues of our time the rise of conservatism and populism in the US, China, Europe, the COVID-19 pandemic, environmental crisis, and ongoing military occupations, and the presence of US empire in places like Japan, South Korea, Israel, Palestine, make the fantasy of the good life all the more unreachable for the large sectors of the world. Berlin writes that, quote, the affective structure of an optimistic attachment involves a sustaining inclination to return to the scene of fantasy that enables you to expect that this time, nearness to this thing will help you or a world to become different in just the right way, end of quote. In my brief comments today, I turn to everyday scene of ordinary violence, ongoing forms of affective attachments, and queer visual arts to suggest some ways to think the political alongside queer desire and offense. Uh, I'm to dissect the ongoing scenes of ordinary crisis in Hong Kong, it might be useful to situate Hong Kong with a broader genealogy. I'm writing at a moment when Hong Kong has just surpassed the two year anniversary of the anti-extradition law amendment bill movement, uh, shorthand uh, anti-ELAP. The anti-ELAP movement refers to a mass social movement aimed at overturning an extradition bill that the chief executive, uh, Carrie Lam, introduced in February, 2019. This bill, if passed successfully, would extradite serious crime offenders to mainland China but carry with it disastrous consequences and erosion of democratic freedom. Since June 30th, 2020, the PRC, People's Republic of China and Hong Kong also passed a new national security law, which aims to ensure national security for Hong Kong's post-colonial governance and economic prosperity. 
in the months uh, after um, the, pass, um, the passage of the law, pro-democratic politicians like Joshua Wong, uh, who participated at the annual June 4th Tiananmen Square vigil have been uh, sentenced, to, sentenced to jail. A majority anti, um, a major anti-establishment newspaper, Apple Daily, was forced uh, was forced to shut down, and uh, you see the last day of printing of the newspaper, and people lining up uh, the last day to um, purchase the newspaper. And a few um, professors who are active in the local social movements could not uh, either was uh, sacked or they uh, did not get their contract renewed or um, basically didn't get tenure. So while the 2019 protests captivated global attention due to the powerful movement that erupted in the summer, it also brought millions of Hong Kong people to the street to voice their opposition to the extradition bill. June 9, uh, 2019 brought more than 1 million peaceful protesters to the street, while June 16, 2019 resulted in um, yet another peaceful march number at about 2 million people. The subsequent escalation of violence from both the police and the protester sides have resulted in serious mistrust between Hong Kong people, the government, and the police. So to show how crisis is mediated as scenes of ordinary ongoing violence in Hong Kong, I'd like to briefly turn to um, the treatment of um, Southeast Asian domestic workers at the outbreak of the pandemic in 2020. The outsourcing and transfer of care work globally refers to what Richelle Puranis terms the international division of reproductive labor, where middle class and economically privileged women purchase the domestic services of, of Filipino domestic workers and other workers from Southeast Asia, who often in turn purchase the domestic work provided by subaltern women back home who are too economically disenfranchised to move globally. Currently, there are more than 400,000 um, domestic um, workers from the Philippines, um, Indonesia, Thailand, and Sri Lanka who are working in Hong Kong. Many who left Hong Kong for their annual visit back home in the Philippines found it impossible to return to Hong Kong for work um, during February 20th, uh, 2020th, um, when the government imposed um, travel ban. For those who continue working in Hong Kong, um, school suspension in early February 2020 for both K-12 and college students means that the domestic space is suddenly more crowded than usual. On the top of performing the usual domestic tasks, uh, many foreign domestic maids found their employer to be uh, emotionally unstable, extremely demanding, and increasingly regulatory over um, their behaviors. Many domestic workers are discouraged to take their only day off in the week on Sunday due to the fear um, by employers that their live-in may might bring contagions from outside. So here you see actually um, the police um, um, monitoring um, um, their gatherings on usually on Sunday and um, also the kind of pictures that usually circulate in the, in the, in, in the media. The normality and sanctity of the domestic sphere is heavily guarded through the logic of policing imaginary threats from the outside. The racialization and gendering of domestic workers as outsiders whose hygiene and not to mention uh, sexual practices and queer desire must be constantly monitored is of course fraught through uh, with contradictions in racial and sexual terms. One domestic workers anonymized as Lovsky uh, remar remarks on the racialized economy of risk and the extreme burden of work during the pandemic. There are just too many people um, in the small space. They get upset over little things like how much bleach to use and how many times surfaces should be wiped down. A friend joked on WhatsApp, uh, a phone, um, a social network apps on the phone, that she died from the smell of chlorine before the virus kills her. So uh, I have sketched um, so far scenes of the contemporary social reproduction in Hong Kong as one of crisis embedded in ordinariness and how narratives of good life remain out of reach for the majority of folks on the social margin. 
Um, in my closing remarks, uh, I'd like to invoke the possibility of seeing Hong Kong queerly from the visual optic of what Gayatri Gopinath terms uh, unruly visions. So in Unruly Visions, um, Gopinath defines queerness as a mode of reading queer desire and intimacies across multiple racial formations, um, bodies of knowledge, geographies, and temporalities through a particular South-South regional imaginary. Gopinath writes, quotes, this queer optic reanimates the non-normative desires, practices, embodiments, and affiliations that can be gleaned from the past it brings them into the present in order to envision uh, other possibilities of social life. So, um, and in uh, January to uh, February um, 2021, so this is just six months after the passage of the national security law, a queer art exhibition entitled Unruly Visions was held in WMA space in Central uh, in the financial district on Hong Kong Island. The exhibition was inspired by the works of queer theorists such as Jose Munoz and Gayatri Gopinath, created by um, uh, visual artists, but also academic, uh, De Gaman. It features the works of nine emerging LGBT visual artists in Hong Kong. The editorial statement frames the aim of the exhibition boldly, quotes, unruly visions for our exhibition is a queer proposition to dissent and disrupt, to reframe, to question how we see and what we know. Well, uh, one photograph from the series, The Couple by the visual artist uh, from Ming Sum depicts a queer lesbian couple enjoying themselves and sitting on a bench in an urban landscape. Other works such as Dancer and Reader by Y.W. Guan feature queer bodies in Hong Kong that disrupts the mundane urban space with queer gestures and bodily stillness. So, and the, the one on the right is literally standing in the middle of the tunnel. And uh, Nelson Tan Chekman, uh, the form, a former student journalist who was arrested by the police doing one illegal assembly, um, produces the series called Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? which features a transgender subject looking back at a young man that looks like a protester with a mask. Tan's photograph invites the viewer to ponder at the possibility that queer subjects are also participants in the 2019 social movement, and also to rethink the relationship between queer desire, social movement, and the historical presence. So that's all I have uh, for today, and I really look forward to the conversation later on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alvin. Um, what a pleasure to hear your to hear your thoughts. Um, Josie, we'll turn it over to you now. You're muted, Josie. Really? Still after all this time, <laughs> you start talking and you're muted. Um, so we were asked to think about um, uh, cruel optimism, uh, Lauren Berlant's book within, you know, the context of our work and the context of um, worlds other than uh, the US and Europe. And there is indeed um, a lot of friction uh, in Lauren Berlant's theory of cruel optimism, a lot of friction uh, between her um, construction of uh, cruel optimism and its impact or how it could be applied or how we could read um, the, 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 the first world, third world divide through it. And I am going to speak as, as <laughs> Brenda and Alvin already have so brilliantly spoken to the incongruity of the concept of a situation tragedy or a good life within um, the Latin American context, especially through the filter of the migration crisis that um, you know, that the crisis that actually has become uh, just simply a way for Latin America to deal with uh, the ongoing, I wouldn't say crisis ordinary, because none of these crises are ordinary, even if, because an ordinary crisis implies that there's nothing we could do to fix it, right? In my view, it implies like there's no, there's no change we could make. And in my view, there's there's always changes that could be made. So I was very drawn by this 
definition of in that she gives in this quote in the situation tragedy the subject's world is fra fragile beyond repair one gesture away from losing all aspect asset access to sustaining its fantasies the situation threatens utter abject unraveling and again i was thinking is this situation tragedy how would i think about it within the context of central america for example or and i think it's actually more or or southern mexico it's more a tragedy that's situational the subject uh is beyond any sustaining fantasies except perhaps the fantasy of sustaining life um because so you know that leads us to say well what is a good life uh, berlant talks about bad luck um, you know, as something that that um, as she puts it on in her book, uh, bad luck as something that um, happens to interrupt the fantasy of the of the good life. But what happens when bad luck is uh, precisely by design? Right. I mean, I think I'm not suggesting that that Berlant isn't aware of all of these things. But when you think about this within the third well, within Latin America anyway, it, it has a very different connotation, right? You know, the, this is, the situation as, as the tragedy as situational is precisely brought in by the ongoing neocolonial neo extraction that happens within Latin America, coupled with climate change, right? The ongoing um, genocide of indigenous peoples, in large part to dispossess them of territories that have um, that have uh, minerals that are necessary for our cell phones, for our, uh, for the batteries that are going to be used for uh, storing wind energy and solar energy. Uh, so, so or it, it, all of these things <laughs> make the crisis of neoliberalism seem almost quaint, right? The crisis of the neoliberal structural adjustments that were imposed upon uh, upon uh, Mexico, Central America, Chile, you know, that makes that seem almost, or I suppose it has become ordinary, right? The crisis of neoliberalism. But again, it's um, where you can see uh, governments like Mexico's government, like recently um, banning, uh, banning GMO corn and banning glyphosate, right? So fertilizers uh, and, and pesticides that are deadly. Um, and that have been banned in the United States. Uh, this, this, you can address neoliberalism, right? Addressing climate change, addressing the constant need for the extraction of materials that actually enable our good life. How do we address that, right? How do we address that in a way that uh, isn't uh, is is kind of in my in my view a little bit beyond fantasies of the good life in 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 the in the in the us right it exceeds the it exceeds that so um i also was thinking like what you know what 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 would be a fantasy of a of a good life in the case of latin america and i was like oh well we had a big fantasy of a good life for about 50 years and it was revolutionary movements and and again, what hammer was brought down on that on that revolutionary movement? It was the it was the hammer of 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 you know U.S. backed counterinsurgency campaigns because of the need for the goods that are produced in these areas, right? I don't I do believe that of course racism plays a huge part in in genocide, but it it it's the fact that indigenous peoples are sitting on this biodiversity that's you know, they have territorial control of areas of biodiversity that houses resources that you know, transnational corporations still need to get a hold of. So I was like, there, there was this collective fantasy of a good life, and it was replaced by um, my migration, uh, right, and, and fleeing from these crises. I'm not even talking about the drug war, which is what brings asylum seekers to our to our to our borders uh, most recently, right? The violence again of uh, of of the, that shows the interrelatedness of the war, right? As it's our drug consumption that sustains a very gendered violence, uh, you know, in Central America by the MS-13 and Barrio 18 in Mexico by the Zetas, the Sinaloa cartel. This violence is always uh, 
necessary for the extraction and production and distribution of these resources that that we consume that that makes our good life um, you know possible I wanted to just end if I if I can share my screen uh, with um, this uh, let me see if I can go how do I do it I start the slideshow right um, I want to do that. How do I do that? Can somebody help me do that? Because I, I, I was, I was really uh, um, uh, amazed. It's at the bottom of the screen. It's at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I'm yeah. Your that. slideshow, um, bottom right hand side. Again, how have I not screen. learned this by now? But I haven't. Yep, you're going in the right direction. Down to the right. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, a little no? to the left. There you go. <laughs> a little more to the. <laughs> Keep keep going to the right. Keep going to the, to the right. right. There, there. No. No. Keep going to the right. <laughs> um, okay. There you yeah. go. You got it. No. Now I've gone away entirely. Can you see my slide? Yeah. There you go. You got it. Okay. Well, um, unfortunately, I can't see my slide, so I'm not going to do the full screen. I apologize. Um, but I was very taken by the, the, these murals that were part of the Los Angeles Latin America um, uh, exhibition that happened two years ago, uh, sponsored by Pacific Standard Time and the, um, and the Guggenheim. And here we have, uh, these are Zapotec uh, artists, uh, the Tlacolu Locos from Tlacolula, Oaxaca, who were invited by the Zapotec population in uh, Los Angeles to participate and to bring these murals. And I, I was very struck by, by the fact that the fantasy of the good life, the fantasy of the good life for these indigenous migrants who come to the United States is the fantasy of achieving the marginal status that Chicanos have, right? And I love this mixture of the aesthetics that we see here of the kind of traditional indigenous trajes, the jewelry, even the grecas that one would find on the mur on the in the ruins in in um, well the indigenous ruins in Oaxaca, right onto their faces this tattooing. These this is not tattooing isn't part of uh, indigenous uh, cultural expression in Latin America, but in, in Oaxaca anyway. But because of this kind of um, migra migration and the the trans I suppose I would say uh, transculturation or transnationalization of uh, Chicano culture. It's it was just interesting to me that the fantasy of a good life, and this has been true always for Central Americans, right? Is can we achieve the status of the marginalized minority in the United States? Because that that would be a good life in comparison with the constant exposure. Uh, you know, to death and gendered violence. That's, that's, you know, uh, as I said, tragedy is situational, right? It's the necessary violence for the production of what sustains our good life. Um, so that I'd want to stop. Let me stop the share. I don't know what. Okay. Thank uh, you so much, Josie. And now my camera has gone out somehow. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. So, um, so let's let's engage in a in a discussion here between the three of you. I, I found all of your presentations so incredibly rich and engaging. And one of the things that struck me is that is how all of you go to the aesthetic, right? And so this is exactly what Brinda was sort of thematizing for us, you know, as she puts it, you know, the aesthetics of new genres and sort of forcing us to really pay attention to Berlant's, you know, focus on, on genre and form. And it strikes me, you know, in all your presentations, as I said, you know, the aesthetic becomes precisely that space of the glitch, you know, the impasse. Um, so this to me, and, you know, Josie sort of mentioned this in, in, you know, Josie, in your initial comments where you said you don't like the notion of crisis ordinariness because it, it gives a sense of no possibility. And you know, this is this is something I was really thinking about listening to all of you. Is you know, where is the sense of, and where is the sense of possibility, transformation, change, um, alternatives in Berlant's text? You know, and I think all of you are kind of speaking to that in the way in which you're reading the aesthetic. 
So um, I'm wondering if we can talk about that because, uh, you know, just to tell, give you a sense, my initial entry into Berlant's text was reading it with Jose Munoz in a graduate seminar that we taught together called The Good Life. And so we read Lauren's book with Jose's um, uh, um, Cruising Utopia. So I was very glad that um, Alvin, you sort of brought Jose Munoz's work into the mix because putting those two texts in conversation, I was, I think we all in that class were really struck by, you know, where is the space of possibility in, in Berlant's text? You know, where do, we, where do we encounter that? And for Munoz, it's very clear. It's, it's precisely in the space of the aesthetic and it's in queer relationality and um, notions of queer affiliation. So, um, so maybe we can just sort of start with that. Um, Brinda, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I think you're, you're really giving us that in, in the ways in which you laid out these different genres for us. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, uh, you know, I've been struck by the fact that over and over now that I was going back, you know, I went back to the book and I was reading it uh, more carefully. Um, that there are all these terms that uh, that Berlant uses uh, along with aesthetics, you know, aesthetics of disturbance, aesthetics of um, of the ordinary, um, uh, how one has to, you know, uh, he says some uh, they say somewhere uh, to interfere with the work of trauma means to refuse its temporality, its insistence on saturating the present. So there's always this sense, I think, of of combating. Uh, the present in its, uh, it, even as it is, you know, flowing past one, that that uh, that there's a sense of resistance, which I think comes uh, comes clearly in in um, their readings of uh, of so many texts, uh, you know, films and um, and and literary texts, etc. So uh, so I think that uh, it's, you know, the fantasy is apparently the good life, but the good life is not the good life in the way that you know, the term appears, right? That, that the good life itself is a recognition of all these complexities mm -hmm. and the fact that there has to be these, uh, uh, you know, these constant um, kind of resistances and, and ways of, of, uh, of looking and reading and, and uh, watching and being. So, so, it, so it, you know, the present is also not a moment, it's an impasse, as, as you said, and sometimes it becomes a glitch, but the glitch is what causes disturbance. And then there is this sense that, that, you know, can you move out of it and, and can there be something beyond it? Beyond is a word that, that Berlant uses um, uh, a lot. So, um, and, and the other text, I mean, other than uh, Minos, I mean, I've, I've thought of in, uh, in conjunction with, um, with Berlant is, um, is Halberstam's Queer Art of Failure. Um, you know, so again, uh, the idea that uh, that failure itself um, a can be an art, and and there can be a queer art uh, of, of failure. Again, I think uh, goes back to interrogating the idea of, you know, what 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 does good life mean for aesthetics? You know, it clearly doesn't mean uh, you know everything works and and everything is pretty. So. Um, uh, so the the questioning and the the the, the constant kind of um, you know conversational dialogic mode in uh, in uh, reading aesthetics is something that and I think disturbance glitch impasse I mean these are the words that keep coming back so uh, you know I find those far more fruitful than than uh, uh, you know uh, sort of mourning what of course what what we know we have lost or we don't have. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Alvin, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, so I think um, the question that um, Josie um, raised and also um, Gayatri was just um, talking about um, teaching um, Berlin uh, alongside Munoz. And I also felt when I was reading Cruel Optimism that um, a lot of the examples are still fairly US centric or when sometimes in the novels when they talk about uh, African American uh, urban uh, poor um, uh, robbing the, uh, the, the house of the um, white middle class lady but then they could not actually deal with the kind of money that they, they get because they 
are not used to the, the normativity of the good life that white um, middle-class Americans always enjoy. So there is, I, I think there is some kind of um, um, sort of um, discourse about uh, exceptionalism and certain racial category that are reinforced. But what I thought was interesting um, that, that was helpful for me was um, she was also, uh, as um, uh, Brenda was talking about, um, trying to move beyond trauma because that's the kind of, um, that's the sort of Kathy Karouf one school of um, um, theory that talks about um, historical injustice and so on and so forth. And I also think she might be, uh, um, that that they um, Berlin that they might be um, um, trying to um, um, queer the binary of um, the Foucauldian uh, biopolitics, which is about the management of life, um, which is, has a certain historical um, um, sort of uh, trajectory versus um, Membembe uh, necropolitics, and trying to um, think about uh, the present and. Uh, the ordinary as an impasse that uh, reproduces various forms of violence. And uh, what I thought the aesthetic um, can do or uh, in a place like uh, Hong Kong, which um, if we talk about late capitalism, Hong Kong is actually probably the most violent space of late capitalism. It's a place where runaway capitals are always um, we, um, that always in here in Hong Kong, it's also uh, um, one of the cities that has the highest real estate um, markets in the world. So um, the ordinary, uh, the ordinariness or the impasse or the uh, norms of uh, neoliberalism um, might be uh, unpacked uh, through, um, recently I've been looking a lot at uh, queer migrants uh, documentary. And today I actually just talked a film called uh, Sunday Beauty Queens um, made by um, uh, Filipino uh, queer filmmaker Ruth uh, Valamira. And it's about uh, the beauty pageants, but it's seen through um, the lens of a tomboy um, figure who uh, beside working for seven, uh, six days a week still, um, still um, you know, organize the beauty pageants. So I think it's about, um, work uh, is about working through the ordinariness is actually about working through the the um uh, uh, the kind of exceptional violence and exceptional racialization um sort of uh exception to neoliberalism that sort of iowa on talks about and how racialized and queer subjects work through these um either ordinary or exceptional modes of violence and how they create uh, aesthetic work in film and literature that reckoned with this history of violence Amazing. Thank you so much, Alvin. Josie, do you want to add anything? Oh, you. Um, yes. Uh, well, I would say that um, I suppose that the, the, her theory really worked so well for capturing the moment of the present, right, that we are living in, the end of this optimism that its expression is white supremacy. So if we could understand um or the you know cruel optimism as a as a as precisely or white supremacy as precisely the expression of the end of that optimism right or the what when that optimism is challenged that can be very useful in terms of the aesthetics um you know and and the place of trauma again i feel like you know trauma is situational you know and so um uh the, the in latin america we have many many theories of trauma and a lot of aesthetic production around the trauma of you know the dictatorships around disappearance around torture uh you know i feel like putting this conversation uh putting cruel optimism in conversation with um all of the literature that came out around testimonio which is like how do you put into words a violence that is 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 unspeakable you know what i mean that it, that has moved beyond language right or hot and and you have to come to grips with that because it's those it's only the it's the aesthetics and of course you know these are regional it's the aesthetics of trauma that that interrupt the fantasy right and i think it is very necessary to interrupt the fantasy you know so like everything like you know everything from little red schoolhouse right that 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 documents it's a, a diary of a survivor of the argentine uh secret uh 
secret camps and to something as recent as 2020 Jairo Bustamante's La Llorona, which rethinks the myth of La Llorona as a mother who, and it was, it's really amazing, right? Because it's finally not this kind of misogynist rendition of La Llorona, the mother who's killed her children because she's been jilted, you know, by her lover. And it makes La Llorona somebody who is bringing justice to the Guatemalan gener generals like Rios Montt who never faced justice. And so her, her then her whole, so how th these aesthetic forms can be resignified as a way of reminding us that of the, uh, tragedy as situational that 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 at least in Latin America has been the reality for the majority of the 20th century mm -hmm. and now part of 21st. Yeah, thank you, Josie. Um, you know, I'll just say one of the things that struck me when you were talking about the good life is that, you know, are, are all forms of good of are all fantasies of the good life necessarily cruel optimism? Because as you said, you know, the fantasy of revolution right, of actual revolutionary transformation isn't necessarily cruel optimism. And so, you know, just thinking about sort of the failures of revolution and perhaps, you know, that's where Brinda, you know, focusing on the glitch, the impasse, the disturbance is actually the place where alternatives can happen because we've seen what's happened to revolutions, right, anyway. Um, so, uh, so let's go to the questions. Um, Shreyashi, do you want to um, take them for us? Yeah, I thank you, Professor Gayatri. Uh, thank you, Brinda, Alvin, and Josie. This was such a rich conversation coming from non-West, non-US, and non-European perspectives, and I think the audience quite enjoyed it. Um, our first question is that how does decentering the US um, challenge Berlin's definitions of fantasy, optimism, and cruelty, and especially with respect to your own work from India, Hong Kong, and the Latin Americas. I mean, I kind of think that that's what they were talking about the whole time. <laughs> so, but do you wanna add anything, speakers? Um, I was just remembering that uh, that Berlant in a, in a conversation with Jay Prosser, I think in, uh, in the journal biography, uh, you know, said very definitively that uh, that cruel optimism is transnational, uh, even though uh, you know many of her uh, most of her uh, references and and uh, the texts that uh, that um, uh, that they look at um, are U.S. centric for for the location that uh, that they're in. But um, so so I think that the frames. I mean, and and, and I you know uh, I anyway have a problem with um, you know the the recent uh, very nativist turn in in uh, critical thinking, which which uh, says that you 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 know you cannot look at um, let's say Indian um, literature through um, through theories that uh, that are not. Uh, generated in India, and I find that uh, because I think critical thinking is something faster than than that, and and one can always, um, you know, uh, sort of come in with with other perspectives. And I'm sure that the thinkers and Berlant uh, him, uh, themselves had actually said this that um, they wanted to talk across nations and and hoped to be talking to to people outside of of uh, the us which the book has done i think but but there is always this kind of looping back into a certain kind of guilt uh, that uh, current scholarship has uh, has generated at least in our part of the world i don't know uh, whether it has done that elsewhere but um which i find very reductive and uh, uh, you know limiting because uh, because i think one can uh, one can also raise uh, questions through frameworks that may or may not apply, you know, as, as Josie was saying, or uh, Alvin was saying that, that um, everything will not apply, but then one can take the germ of an idea and then run with it, uh, uh, you know, which I, which I think uh, that so many people have done with, uh, with these important interventions like Berlin's book. Absolutely. Well, I I also think it's 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 irony or perhaps it's like the irony of history, right? That indigenous uh, movements in Latin America have this term, the good life, right? And it has it's not uh, consumptive, right? It's actually based on it's not a consumptive based model, and it is based on how do you maintain uh, you know natural resources, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, there's no reason to have expected 
Lauren Berlant to have known of this social movement, which is happening, you know, coterminous with the, 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 the writing of the book. But, but there is actually an alt, a non-consumptive version of The Good Life. It has, it's much too complicated to go into, but, you know, and, and, that, and you, you know, you, there's a word for it in Aymara, there's a word for it in Nahuatl, there's a, you know, there is this concept organizing, even though there are, you know, hundreds of indigenous uh, peoples organizing them a across the, the hemisphere. It's now even come into the U.S., right? This idea of the good life that is a non-consumptive life, which would be interesting to have perhaps another conversation about that. But. Yeah, no, that's that's so crucial. Yeah. Alvin, do you want to add anything? In yeah, so in terms, I was also thinking about um, maybe from uh, Sinophone and Hong Kong uh, and different sort of post-colonial sites, uh, what the good life might, might mean. And then I was also thinking about if we think about in more concrete term, um, the good life narrative that might not be US centric and white. In Hong Kong, actually, there was this uh, good life narrative called the uh, uh, Four Little Ideology, which is uh, which emerged around the 70s when light manufacturing industry really took off and Hong Kong slowly become the center for finance capitalism. And the four uh, little ideology is that if you have um, if you have a wife, if you have a car, and if you have a son, and you also have um, a house, then that's the good life. But that's of course very heteronormative, and that's something that I cannot identify with at all. And then uh, if we also think about um, homonormativity and how it's sort of or queer liberalism and how it expresses its various forms in in Asia, I think in Hong Kong recently a lot of the legal cases that came through um, that made uh, victory, a lot of them are actually about uh, attracting global talents. So there was a a case for lesbian spousal visa that um, if you come with, uh, if you have a marital status from outside of Hong Kong, uh, your dependents can be uh, can get visa. But a lot of these cases actually reproduce a certain kind of cosmopolitan uh, mobility that might not actually benefit the um, local working class or actually the local Hong Kong queer LGBT subjects. So I'm, I'm also thinking about um, the good life and how it has multiple iteration as it intersects with race, nationality, and, um, and global capital. Yeah, thank you. So we're actually almost out of time, but I do want to maybe go over a few minutes and so we can just get one more question in. Um, Shriyashi? Yeah, um, our next question is, can we think of spaces of humor as attempts at looking at alternatives to the impasse of crisis ordinariness? And can they help us rethink socially, politically, the guided good life? Anybody want to take that? Um, I, I'll take that. <laughs> you know, there's an artist, a Chicano artist, he's called Elvis instead of Elvis, but he's an Elvis imitation. And, and he said one thing, and I heard it so many years ago, that was really, uh, you really made me laugh. And it's like, Chicanos don't get the blues, we get the periwinkles. <laughs> and I mean, it's precisely that, that use of humor that, that makes you think like, yeah, yeah, we have it. We have it bad, but we don't have it that bad, you know. So maybe that's a that's a way in which humor does. I mean, if you don't laugh in the face of these violences, you know, I mean that's a horrible thing to say. But if you don't find a way to maintain a sense of humor in the set in the in the in the face of this, uh, you know, situation tragedy as situational, it's 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 hard to survive. Mm -hmm. Alvin or Brenda. Um, well, yes, I mean, I, I, I just agree. Of course, there's a, there's a whole lineage and tradition of, of um, satire and irony and, and uh, you know, we, and we, it's come from, um, you know, all the, the many of the, in, in India, we have the regional languages, lots of nonsense verse um, that, uh, uh, you know, that were making um, uh, sort of ironical comments on social uh, structures and, and, and rules I mean, coming down ages and now we have the memes of course and and uh, you know the the turning around of of um, children's poetry and and things like that into uh, into uh, you know uh, addressing the present and uh, uh, 
we even have a, a, a chief minister in Bengal who, uh, you know, writes, uh, you know, sort of chants uh, funny things as as uh, she addresses the crowd. And so, so there are all kinds of, I, I think, of course, you know, most texts, um, even the tragic texts always uh, have irony and, and satire and, and you know, just, just plain laughter, as, as Julie said, that at some point we just have to laugh at uh, the, the histrionics and, and the, the, the sheer ridiculousness of some of the, the impositions, right? But um, yeah. Alvin, any thoughts? Uh, it's kind of, yeah, I, I think I need to think through it, but I, I was also thinking about um, that, that we do have a genealogy of um, sort of um, queer pleasure. And I was also uh, uh, thinking back to Munoz and this identification, how do minoritarian, minoritarian subject work through these modes of survival that is neither assimilation or, or very um, clear resistance, but actually um, through um, um, working through and working with um, uh, existing system of uh, power and um, and in terms of teaching, I've been actually been teaching a lot of texts that um, work through um, the state of uh, negativity of being queer racialized subjects, such as um, um, uh, Ten Honed um, uh, film Forever Bottom, and I was um, and and I think the students really um, is uh, is thinking through these issues, right? Um, and how how do we um, yeah precisely to think through queer survival um, uh, um, within the spaces of um, cruel optimism and all the violence that are happening in the world. Yeah, thank you so much. So we're out of time, but um, I see a lot of really fascinating questions um, in the in the Q and A. So we'll be sure to send that. Shashi, can we um, can we send that to the panelists? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, I think yeah. we'll have the recording so we can send it. Okay, so we'll do that. But I just wanted to thank you, all three of you, for just your brilliant insights. I, I found it so rich, and I feel like we could continue talking. Um, I'm sorry our time is so short, but thank you all so much, um, and take care. And thank you so much to the audience for tuning in. All right, everyone, take care. Thank you, Gary. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.